So thank you, thank you all for coming. Uh, so today we are going to talk about uh, yeah, vision, uh, vision beyond classification. And I guess like the first question is why do we need to go beyond the classification? Um, so you know how they say that a picture is worth a thousand words? Uh, and we say that because like the, the world that we live in is very rich and very complex uh, from a visual point of view. And most of the information that we capture about our surroundings comes from our eyes. So 80% uh, of the information uh, comes from, from the eyes. Um, so however, classification models, uh, they can only learn a few words about, uh, about an image. So if you take this uh, particular image, which I think is quite a nice one, um, and pass it through an image uh, classifier, ResNet50, which is a very popular image classifier, it will tell you something like bicycle and garden. Uh, and these are correct, uh, correct answers. However, I think we are far from understanding, from correctly parsing the scene that, uh, that we see here. So first of all, uh, we have two bicycles in the, in the scene, and then we have uh, persons on, on those bicycles. And at first you might think that they're riding those bicycles, but then uh, when you look closely, you can notice that, okay, one of the bicycles and person, uh, they're upside down. So that does not really correspond with the, with the biases that we have about uh, the physics in, uh, in our world. Um, and so, yeah, there is, there is a really more to this scene uh, that we need to understand. So first of all, yeah, we need to understand the pose of these objects with respect to the camera and also the relative pose, like uh, the pose of the objects with respect to each other. And then um, at the closer inspection, uh, we notice that, okay, this is actually a top-down view. So the camera is actually positioned at the top. So this image was actually taken with a drone uh, at the top of the, of the garden. So, like the holy grail in computer vision is we want to, to train a system that achieves human level scene understanding. Because if we have that, then we have really a large number of applications that become available. So first of all, think about visually impaired people. Uh, so such a system could help them navigate environments. And then we have all kinds of uh, uh, applications of uh, virtual reality or augmented reality that uh, we could, uh, we could uh, have. And then any kind of robotics or autonomous vehicles. And something that I, I am really interested in, I believe that if we advance research in designing such a system, we will also achieve a better understanding of our brain, of how uh, our visual system works. However, designing a system that really achieves human level uh, scene understanding is a very challenging task because there are so many factors to take into account. Um, so, for example, as I mentioned, we have uh, different tasks that we need to think about, like object detection and pose estimation and camera position and others. And then we need to think, okay, in which order should we, should we tackle these tasks? And then we can have different inputs and different structure in the outputs, as we will see, we will see today. Uh, and then we might have different priors about the world that we might uh, be tempted to, to want to inject in these models, or we might want to let these models learn everything end to end. And of course, we want these models to be as accurate as possible, but this might conflict somewhat with the efficiency of, uh, of the models. So the, the search space is huge, uh, and yeah, there's really a lot of work to be done. So today, I am going to guide you a bit through this, uh, to explore this space, and we are going to literally take this construction, supervised image classification, and we are going to try to replace each word in, uh, in this and see what we get. So in the first part, we are going to replace classification and see what other tasks are, uh, are there. Uh, then we are going to replace image, like we, are, we will replace the single image input and see what other inputs we can use for, uh, for our models. And then we will replace the supervised part and uh, try to go like, beyond the, the strong supervision. So I will not be talking here about the unsupervised learning, which is a very important topic, because this will, this will be covered later uh, in, the, in the lecture series by one of my colleagues, I will talk about self-supervised learning. And then we will end with, uh, with a few open questions in, in the field. So in the previous lectures, my colleagues have introduced uh, deep learning as this, uh, this deep learning puzzle as being a very, a very flexible framework where we have these computational nodes. And then uh, we can use these computational nodes to learn a mapping between input nodes and output nodes. So, um, and then we use, uh, we have this loss function node. Oops, sorry. We have the loss function node 
um, <clears throat> that helps us train the system uh, so that it makes predictions that are as close as possible to, to the tar desired target. So by the end of this lecture, you will know how to redefine these building blocks so that we can perform different visual tasks using different uh, types of inputs and different forms of, uh, of supervision. Okay, so let's start uh, with the tasks beyond the classification. So the topics that, uh, that we will cover, uh, so we will see different task definitions um, and we will see models for these tasks and how to train and evaluate them. And then some uh, tricks of the trade. We will not go exactly in this order over the topics because they are really uh, like intertwined. So, uh, but these are the topics that we will cover. So other important tasks uh, for, for scene understanding, but that we will not have time to cover. I'm listing here two, for example, um, image captioning, uh, where you take, you give, a, you give an image to a system and then the system has to generate a language description of, uh, of the image. So for example, here, uh, the system could generate two beach chairs under an umbrella on, on the beach. Uh, and this problem could be uh, stated as a classification problem where you give like, let's say a thousand different possible answers and the system has to choose uh, the correct one. Or the system could generate the description like in a free form language, which is a more difficult task, but uh, maybe more meaningful actually. And another task that uh, is also important for um, for scene understanding uh, for is pose estimation, where we actually define key points on the human key, uh, pose estimation, where we define key points on the human body, and then we want to detect those and to track those so that we can uh, learn about the position of the people in the, in the scene. And this, for example, is very useful in any gaming application that, uh, that you might imagine. Okay, so let's see the tasks that we are really going to, to cover. Um, and I've listed them here, like in an increasing, uh, increasing granularity, like we want to get more and more details about the scene. So we, uh, in the previous lectures, my colleagues covered classification, where you only get like a sparse, uh, a sparse description of, of the image, like just a few words. And then today we will see object detection, semantic segmentation, and a note on instance segmentation. Okay, so task one, object detection. So first of all, object detection is a multitask problem because uh, we want to classify the objects, like to assign it to a category, and we want to localize the object. Like we want to know the position of the object in the image. Like what I'm showing here, I want for this object to know that it belongs to the class sheep, and then I want to know the location, and I'm indicating this through this uh, bounding box. So for this, uh, for this task, the input uh, to, to the system is an RGB image, um, with height and width and three channels of, uh, of color. Uh, and then the output, uh, it's a class label, like a one, one, hot, one hot encoding for the, for the class label where we have zeros everywhere the, for the index of the class. Um, and then we want to have a bounding box around the object for the, for the location of the object. And generally we parameterize this through the coordinates of the center and height and width. Um, and we want to do this for every object in the scene. So for the, for the previous image that I've shown, this would be the desired output. Okay, so uh, to train such a system, we would need a data set where we have samples for training and for testing. And then in this data set, we would have uh, samples and then uh, each sample would contain, uh, would contain an image, as I said, an RGB image. And then we have a list of objects so for different images, we can have different numbers of objects. So then here we have this list of, uh, of objects and then for each object, we have the label as a one hot and then we have the bounding box with the four coordinates. So uh, in, the, in the previous lectures, you've seen how to do classification. Now the question is how can we do, um, how can we predict bounding box coordinates which are real values? So like a quick, uh, quick recap. Uh, in classification, we, we train a system, we train a mapping uh, that assigns input data points to, to different classes. So for example, if I have a cat, uh, a cat image, it should put it in a cat category. If I have a car, it, uh, it assigns it to, to a, the car category. So the output in this case is discrete. However, for bounding box prediction, uh, we, we want to, to have a continuous output. Uh, and let's assume that we have a, a model that has, um, has as out, um, an output module with uh, four units that can give me the four, uh, the four coordinates of the bounding box. 
And then I would have something like this. So let's say my ground truth bounding box uh, is the green one, and then my system gives me a prediction like the, the red one. Now, um, <clears throat> I want the, uh, when, to train the system, I need to give it feedback on the, the accuracy of this bounding box. I, I want to say, okay, is it, you, it needs to be smaller, bigger, it needs to be more to the left or to the right. Um, and with, in the classification setting, we, we cannot do that. Like we cannot give this kind of, uh, of feedback because there the data generally is not ordered when we do classification. So if I give you an image of a cat and you mistake it for a chair or you mistake it for a car, like, it's, it's as worse, like you cannot say, oh, that was worse than the other. Uh, whereas for a, a bounding box, you can say, okay, that box should be bigger, that box should be moved to, to the left. And we can achieve this doing regression instead of classification, because in regression, uh, we have uh, continuous, uh, continuous outputs. So the way we generally do regression is we minimize, uh, for example, the quadratic loss. Uh, there are other losses, but quadratic loss is, a, is uh, a simple one. Uh, so for example, here, uh, I'm, I have T would be my ground truth, like the four uh, ground truths uh, coordinates of the bounding box, and then X would be the prediction of the, of the network. And then the goal is to minimize the distance between, uh, between the two. So we minimize the mean squared error over the samples. Like a quick, uh, quick recap, classification versus regression. As I said, in classification, we aim to map inputs to, to predefined classes, whereas in regression, we want to map inputs to continuous, uh, continuous values. Uh, of course, uh, in output, then the, the output will be, uh, uh, sorry, in classification, the output will be discrete, whereas in regression, it's a continuous uh, value. Um, and then we have this difference, this distinction that in classification, there is no uh, order in the data, whereas uh, in regression, we have uh, a notion of order in the data. And there are different algorithms that can be used to, to perform the two. Now, the, so it's all good. We can do regression to, uh, to uh, do bounding box prediction. Now, the problem is that generally we will have more than one object in an image, uh, as I've shown, and we want to detect all of them. So, when I make a prediction, how do I know to which ground truth bounding box should I compare it? So one might say, okay, you take the nearest bounding box and then you assign it to that. But this can get like very messy very quickly. Um, <clears throat> and another uh, way to deal with this, which is uh, uh, slightly cleaner, is to actually approach the problem in, different, in, two, in two steps. First, we do a classification such that we roughly say, okay, to which to which, bound, to which ground truth bounding box uh, your prediction uh, belongs to. And then around that, uh, around that rough prediction, you will refine through, through regression. So, uh, and with like the conversion between uh, regression to, from regression to classification, we do it by discretizing the output values. And what I mean by this is, let's say that uh, my ground truth is like a value like that, like 378, and instead of predicting that, which could be very hard, uh, I actually just bin the output space, yeah? And in equally spaced bins, like here I have like nine, uh, nine bins. And then I project my value, and wherever that falls, that will become my one. And then this will give me the one hot label that I can use in classification. And then if I have another value, then I just get uh, this other uh, one, hot, uh, one hot label. Um, like, yeah, like, I don't, like if you know the game hot and cold, uh, maybe that uh, rings a bell, what it means. Like, uh, if, I, if you think of something and I have to guess what, you, what you've thought of, uh, at first, uh, we, we would play it like this, right? You would tell me hot if uh, I'm close to what you're thinking of or cold if I'm far, uh, and very hot if I'm getting very, very close. So first of all, I do this classification, like I, uh, and once I'm, I'm in the area where it's very hot, then there I can, uh, I can regress and I can uh, make the right prediction like in that, uh, in that space. So this is kind of the, the approach that, uh, that we take here in two steps. So first classification and then uh, regression in that local, uh, local area. Okay, so let's see now uh, detection uh, detectors that can actually that actually apply exactly this uh, this strategy like first the classification and then uh, and then ref refinement through regression um, and I will present two two case studies for this and I, I think like 
first of all, there are many, many papers published on this topic, uh, but I've chosen two that have very good accuracy and I think they're very, they're representative for the, uh, like for the, the class of detectors. So faster RCNN, it's a, stu it's a two stage detector, uh, which, uh, in, in which first you identify uh, good candidate bounding boxes and then we refine through, through regression. So uh, the way this looks like, so we just have first, oh, where did I sit? Here. Um, so first you have your input image and you pass this through a block of uh, convolutional layers uh, where we can all, like we have convolution, ReLU, pooling, as you've seen like in the classification uh, um, models as well. So we pass, uh, we pass this through blocks of convolutional layers and then we obtain here um, feature maps. And then these are passed through, through this branch to get, uh, to identify the most promising bounding boxes. And then once we have these candidates, then we pass, the, then we, uh, we collect the, the features from here. For, like, we collect the features corresponding to these bounding boxes and then we do our final, uh, final regression and uh, classification. So first, uh, first step, as I said, we discretize the output space. So uh, discretizing the out output space means discretizing the bounding box space. So as I said, the bounding box has these four coordinates. So we have two uh, first two coordinates for the center and then height and width. To discretize the space of the centers, we just choose these anchor points and we distribute them uh, uh, uniformly over, over the image. And then for, uh, to, cover, to discretize the, the space for height and width, we just choose candidate, bound, candidate bounding boxes with different uh, scales and ratio. Uh, and then this will give us uh, like nine candidate and sorry n candidates per anchor, um, and generally we choose like three different scales and three different ratios. So that's kind of this uh, in general we use nine candidates per anchor, and then we train a classifier uh, that predicts for um, for every box predicts an objectness score. So here we just say is there an object or not in the box? We don't. Uh, uh, we don't care what the class of the object is. We just want to know if there is an object or not. And uh, then we sort and keep top, uh, top, uh, top candidates, like the, the bounding boxes where the model is most confident that there is, a, that there is a, an object there. And uh, then we refine through regression. So uh, imagine we would have uh, an MLP, like uh, a few, few uh, fully connected layers. Uh, that have at the end four units to, to give me the four, uh, the four coordinates of the bounding box. Um, <coughs> so now we know how to do that. So, uh, and this gives us a good, a good accuracy actually, and it runs uh, uh, decently fast, like at five frames per second. However, something that I didn't uh, make explicit is the fact that the operation that we have here uh, uh, here, when we do, when we uh, take the bounding boxes and we keep the most promising ones, actually this operation is not differentiable. So uh, if you've attended the previous lectures, uh, my colleagues mentioned that, okay, deep learning is very flexible and we can replace those uh, uh, pieces in the puzzle, uh, but we have to put there uh, functions that are differentiable so that we can backprop gradients to them to, to train the system. However, the operations that we have here they're not differentiable, so we cannot backprop gradients to here. Uh, we, so in particular, we cannot uh, uh, backprop gradients with respect to the, the parameters of the bounding box because we, we've just chosen those, uh, we fixed those in advance. So, uh, and uh, I just added there a note. Uh, um, there, there are ways to, to make this operation differentiable. Uh, however, it would complicate things uh, quite, uh, quite a lot, but I encourage you to, to check this paper by Aderberg um, et al, uh, the spatial transformer networks. And there they showed how you can do this operation, the cropping operation that we have here in a differentiable way. So, okay. So as I said, yeah, I'll just uh, add one more uh, note here that because this is not differentiable here, what this means is that we have to train the system in two steps. So first, we train this part uh, here, and then we train, uh, and then once this one is trained, so uh, this one to train it, we, uh, we just uh, generate objectness 
ground truth labels. And uh, the objectness ground truth labels, so we just check if any of the, if any of the uh, bounding boxes here, if they overlap uh, significantly with, with one of the ground truth boxes. Yeah, so, um, and then this is how, uh, yeah, we train this through, through classification. And then once this part is trained, we just uh, put it into the, bigger, uh, into the bigger model, and this part does not get trained after that, right? So this one is just used to give me some, uh, some candidates, but the uh, back propagation happens then through here, right? So um, that, that is what uh, we mean by two-stage detector, right? So first we have to train this uh, region proposal network, uh, if I did, probably didn't mention the, before the name, like it's called the region proposal network. And then we, we plug it into the bigger classifier detector and then we, we get the full, uh, uh, like the full object detector. So this is, uh, and we get, as I said, we get good accuracy with a good, uh, good speed, but it can be quite cumbersome to actually train uh, a system like this. So then we would really like to have a one stage detector where we, where we train everything end to end, and we don't have these uh, issues of non-differentiable uh, building blocks. So I'm uh, presenting here another, uh, so uh, the second case study, this retina, retina net, which is a one stage detector. Um, so I will just say to ignore this part with the hierarchy of here, uh, from here, because I will explain a bit later what, uh, what that exactly is. Um, but let's here focus on the, like, on the bigger picture. So what it does is just, uh, okay, I'll just go back to this one to show, to say, so here we just took uh, convolutional features at one scale from here, right? And then we, we generated our uh, bounding boxes, uh, candidates and uh, predictions. Whereas in this one, we have this hierarchy, hierarchy of features at different resolutions. And I will explain later how exactly we obtain this. And then from the different scales, we just generate um, predictions for bounding box coordinates and for the object, uh, object classes. So as you can see, like the output here. So here we have the output for the, um, for, for the classes of the object. So that's K. K stands for, for the number of classes that I have in the data set. And A stands for the number of uh, anchors of uh, bounding boxes. And then for the second head here, we have four times A, so four uh, stands for the four coordinates of the bounding boxes. So, <clears throat> okay, so wh why don't we just train like this all the detectors? Why, why do we need to have the, the two-stage detector that I showed uh, before? So actually it turns out that if we just do this for all the, uh, all the bounding boxes that we have in the image, actually we will end up with a very poor learning signal and we will never get the, a very good, a very good accuracy. And why this happens is the following. So when, um, when we want to identify the promising candidates, we use uh, the cross entropy loss. So this is a, the loss for classification. Now, uh, if we, if we uh, analyze the, the graph of this, uh, of this loss, uh, so you can observe that the loss penalizes heavily, like here, uh, when, uh, so this is like the probability of the ground truth class. Um, and the, the loss is high when the detector is not confident in the, in the correct class, right? However, it goes down very slowly uh, when, we are start, when the detector starts being correct, right? So even here, uh, like when the, when the uh, probability is higher than uh, 0.6, so that means like the detector is quite confident that uh, in the right class, even there, the loss is still uh, quite significant. It's higher, is uh, higher than zero. And now when you think that we have a ton of examples like this, uh, and they most of the time belong to, to the background, because in an image we will have few objects, but most of the bounding boxes will come from the background. Uh, this will result in really overwhelming the, the useful examples, right? So, and this is why in the previous detector, we had this two-stage operation, right? So the first stage was really responsible to prune all those easy, easy negatives, right? That, were, um, that are just from the background and they really don't help much uh, to train our system. Uh, and in general, one stage detectors to avoid this problem that uh, I've just shown here, they employ hard negative mining heuristics. So 
what, what this means um, is that the way you train uh, a detector like this with hard negative mining is that um, when you build your training set, you start with the set of positive examples, so wherever you have objects, uh, the bounding boxes corresponding to those objects, and then you get a random subset of negative examples, so from the background, and we take a subset because, as I said, like the full set uh, would be uh, would be too big. So, and then you train the detector with this uh, let's more balanced, uh, more balanced uh, training set. Uh, then we test it on unseen images, and then we check where uh, did the detector make mistakes. And it will make mistakes because we've considered only a subset of the negatives, so which means that we are probably not covering well the distribution of the negative uh, of the negative examples. So then we check where the detector made mistakes. Uh, so we check uh, for false positives. So wherever the detector said that there was an object, here I'm giving for a person, um, and those would be our hard negatives that we need to add to the training set, so that and then we retrain it such that the detector can learn to classify those as, uh, as negatives. And we can iterate this uh, several times. So this is an option, um, and uh, I'm encouraging you to, to go to check this reference, which gives a really in-depth presentation of this technique of hard negative mining with a nice uh, formalism using uh, Bayesian theory. Um, however, it is a very uh, quite uh, complicated uh, training procedure. Uh, so instead of doing this, the, the detector that uh, I'm presenting here, the retina net, actually comes with a much simpler and more elegant solution. So instead of doing all this uh, hard negative mining uh, heuristic, uh, it actually modifies the, the, the learning loss. It modifies the, the cross entropy such that the the examples that are well classified, that are in this region, they receive, they, they are downscaled. So uh, we just add the weighting factor so that they, uh, we put less energy into those, uh, into those examples. So, and you can simply do this by adding this, uh, this term here. So this is the focal loss. Uh, so this is the, the loss that they propose. Uh, they, they call it the focal loss. So simply you take your cross entropy and you add this, uh, this uh, weighting term. Um, so what this means is that when you're, you're confident in, this, uh, in your prediction, then this, this uh, term here will downscale, your, uh, uh, will downscale the loss for those, uh, for, for those examples. And now this leads to a really good accuracy. Um, and this is also faster than the, it's faster than the faster RCNN that uh, I've shown before. So this is considered now like state of the art for, uh, for object detection. And it's a simpler detector. Um, as I said, it's a train in, uh, in uh, one, uh, one stage. So yeah, it's, uh, it's much nicer. Okay, so that was for object detection. Let's uh, see now uh, semantic segmentation. Why do we need semantic segmentation? So actually for certain types of object, the bounding box that we get from, uh, from object detectors might not be a good representation. So for example, here, if you look at this, uh, at the, the person, uh, just because the person has the, the arm spread, uh, the bounding box is like very, very wide. And then if you look inside, like most of the pixels in this bounding box, they do not correspond to, to a person. They actually belong to the background or uh, to, to other objects. So we want a more refined, uh, more refined representation. And we can get this through semantic segmentation. So here we really go to the extreme and then we say, okay, I want to assign a class label to every pixel in the image. And then this is a, like a very, very refined, uh, refined representation. So as you see here, uh, I want, uh, I put a label on all the pixels that belong, on only the pixels that belong to a person or I put uh, this label uh, on all the pixels that belong to the class sheep or class dog, and the, all the rest is, uh, is background. Now, uh, we've seen how we can do classification, but now the problem is, okay, how do we do uh, this kind of dense prediction? Because so far we've done like sparse, uh, sparse prediction where we only generated one label per, uh, per image. Now we want to generate an output that has the same resolution as the input. So 
uh, if you've attended previous lecture, you've seen this operation, the pooling operation. Uh, and pooling operation is responsible with reducing the resolution of, uh, of the feature maps. And we generally do a pooling operations such that as we go deeper into, uh, into a model, we want the units to have an increased receptive field. Uh, and we want this because like, when you have a larger receptive field, then you can, uh, you can extract more abstract features. So a uh, pooling operation is where you just compute mean or max. Yeah, like you, you take a window and then you compute mean or max over that window. And that is the value that you copy in your output uh, feature maps. So now to, to upsample, to, to get a dense, uh, a dense output from our network, we need the reverse operation. So we need an unpooling operation. So the simplest uh, operation we can do is to do like nearest neighbor upsampling. So I just take the value in my, in my feature map, I copy it in the corresponding place in the output, in the upsampled uh, output, and then I just, uh, I just copy in the uh, neighboring locations the same, the same value. And I do this for, all the, for the entire feature map, and now I have an upsampled, uh, an upsampled, uh, upsampled activations. So uh, I've just shown like the simplest of the operations, but there are other upsampling methods. Uh, so the thing with this very simple operation is that your, the result will be very blobby. Whatever we get here is very blobby. And this other operations that I mentioned here for upsampling, they, they, want, uh, they try to address this issue of blobbiness. So for example, one thing we can do is to unpool with indices. So we, that mean, what that means is that when we do the pooling operation, we can preserve the indices where the um, max pool, um, like the argmax of the max op of the max operation, in the in the pooling window, uh, and then we can use that uh, the indices to know where to copy in the output, and so uh, that will give you like a, an output uh, feature map with uh, with holes. Uh, but what we do after that, we need to apply like a convolution, and then we can uh, smooth out the. Um, the feature maps. Uh, another, uh, another option is to do deconvolutions. So basically there in deconvolution, you just reverse the operation that you have in convolution and you can upsample through, through that. So I put here references for, for these other methods. So, okay, now we have a, a block that can do upsampling. And I will just show here like a, as a case study, a network that, uh, that does uh, semantic segmentation, so produces an output at the same resolution as the input. So this is a UNET, and this was, um, this was uh, proposed for uh, segmenting uh, medical images. So especially in medical imaging, segmentation is a very important problem, uh, and it really helps a lot, uh, like the practitioners in the, in the field. So uh, in, this, uh, in this model, so you have your input, your input image, we go, it goes through different stages of convolution, uh, convolution ReLU pooling, as, uh, as we know. We get here uh, to the bottleneck. So this, this kind of model, we call it like an encoder-decoder model. So the part, this part would be the encoder, and this is very similar to an image classifier. And then we, uh, when we are here, we've reduced a lot the, the spatial resolution. Now from here, we need to start up sampling, so we go to the decoder part. To, uh, to get an output that really has the same uh, resolution as, uh, as the input. And importantly, as I said, because when we do the upsampling here, uh, we can get like blobby, uh, blobby feature maps, uh, we, can, we add these long steep connections from the, from the layers in the encoder, uh, the same level of uh, resolution. So uh, by adding these steep connections, we can add back in uh, um, like uh, high frequency details that we might have lost when we did pooling and unpooling. So, and these are very important, these keep connections, uh, like you've probably seen them like in the ResNet classifier, uh, and they are, like, they are also very important for training uh, because uh, like this makes uh, back propagation of gradients easier. Like, because now the gradients will back propagate through here, but you will also have gradients that back propagate directly through these uh, skip connections. Okay, so 
And now to train the, this kind of system. So uh, our output, output will have the same size as the input uh, and uh, times number of classes. Because now for every pixel, for every location in the output, I will have a probability distribution over the classes, over the possible classes. So that's why, so for every, every location, I have uh, the distribution over the, the classes. And now to train this, we will use the same uh, cross entropy that uh, we've used before for classification, but now it is average over all the, all the locations in, in the input. Okay, so now just a quick recall of the retina net, the object detector that I showed earlier, uh, where I said that we don't need to understand there uh, how we get that hierarchy of features. So maybe you recognize that it's the same U shape uh, that uh, we had before. Just uh, here it's a bit reversed, yeah? So what they did uh, there is like, this is like the encoder part, yeah? And then this is like the decoder part where um, they, they did upsampling here and then they added the, this long skip connections uh, from the corresponding uh, levels in the, in the encoder, yeah? So this is uh, like, is the, same, is the same idea that is used in both, in both uh, tasks. So um, this, this just shows again how flexible uh, this, these models are, that we can really reuse the same kind of ideas uh, from one model to, to another. Okay, so now uh, we know how to do um, uh, how to do semantic segmentation. However, this can uh, still be very confusing for, especially when we have overlapping objects from the same class, like here, for example. Uh, if you just, you, if you have overlapping objects in the same class, you would just get like a big blob saying sheep, but you don't know where those sheep, uh, where one sheep ends and where the second uh, one begins. Uh, so, uh, what we can do is to avoid this kind of problem is to do instance segmentation. So in instance segmentation, we actually combine object detection and semantic segmentation. So here in semantic segmentation, we just assign um, a pixel to a class category. Here in instance segmentation, we also differentiate the instances from the same class. So now we really have a less confusing um, yeah, a less confusing, confusing output. And yeah, we don't have time to, to go in detail in, into this, uh, this approach, but I encourage you to check the, the paper, the Moscow CNN paper, for example, which is a good, um, gives a good solution for, for this problem. Okay. Um, so we have all these, uh, these detectors. Now, how do we evaluate them? Uh, for detection or semantic segmentation. So in classification, the, to evaluate, uh, it's easy. We just take the accuracy. So that's the percentage of correct predictions uh, out, of, uh, out of the total number of, uh, of predictions. And generally, we use top one or top five. So top one, uh, you give a plus one to the model if uh, the top prediction is, uh, corresponds to the, to the correct class. However, in some data sets, some classes can be quite confusing. Like, uh, like even for people, it would be difficult to, to distinguish between, I don't know, a chair and an art chair or something like that. So then uh, we can be more flexible in the, in the evaluation and we can use this top five score. Uh, so there you give a plus one, a correct, uh, a correct score, if the correct class isn't the top five predictions of, uh, of the model. However, for object detection and semantic segmentation, the evaluation is a bit, uh, diff is a bit different. Uh, so uh, we train object detection, for example, in regression, we train it with a quadratic loss. However, uh, we cannot directly use that same um, uh, measure to evaluate the, the accuracy, uh, the performance of, uh, of the detector, because that might, be, uh, that might mislead uh, mislead us in uh, how good that uh, detector is. And that mainly because um, like quadratic loss is, um, is biased against small objects. Like if you make, like it, consider, it considers in the same way a mistake, let's say of 10 pixels that you make on a large object or a mistake on a, of 10 pixels that you make on a small object. But for the large object, those 10 pixels might represent like, I don't know, 2% of the whole uh, 
of the whole size of the object, whereas for the small object, maybe it's more than half of the, of the object. So we cannot use reliably that measure to, uh, to evaluate performance. So instead, what we use to, to get a, a better um, understanding, uh, it's intersection over union. So in, uh, in this uh, measure, we just take uh, the, like the intersection of the, you take the, the ground truth and then the prediction, and then you take your in, their intersection and divide this by, uh, by their union. So now, actually, we have, like we train the detectors with, uh, with quadratic loss, but then we evaluate them with this IAU intersection over union. Um, this is not uh, recommended in general to use different, uh, different measures between training and testing because, uh, yeah, you might get surprises. Like your, your detector might be very good at training, but then when you evaluate it, you don't get the expected result. Uh, however, um, we cannot directly train with the uh, IOU because uh, it has uh, some max operations when we compute IOU and those are not differentiable. So that's why we cannot directly use that. However, there are some papers, some, some recent papers here that I'm, uh, uh, I've put there uh, where they, they propose some approximations for this, um, for this measure, for IOU, and then we can actually train with, uh, with that same measure. Okay, so then in terms of, um, of, uh, of benchmarks, so uh, for image classification, we had uh, ImageNet. Uh, and really, uh, ImageNet was kind of a game changer in the community because uh, having a benchmark for, for a task can really push progress. Like now things are comparable, people can compare their works uh, between them. So um, it's important then to have such benchmarks for different tasks. Uh, and uh, here I just listed two. There are several of them for object detection and semantic segmentation. Um, so yeah, like uh, Cityscapes is, um, is a benchmark for, for semantic segmentation. They contain, uh, the data set contains mainly like cities, uh, city, city scenes. Um, they're filmed, uh, filmed in different uh, cities in Germany. And and then they, they give uh, ground truth for, for images and they also have uh, some, uh, some videos. Uh, and then the, the second benchmark that I'm showing here, COCO data set, they have ground truth for, uh, for object detection, for semantic segmentation, for image captioning. Yeah, it's, a, it's a very, uh, it's a rich, uh, rich data set. So in general, and in general, this, uh, uh, these benchmarks, they have like a public platform where you can just submit your model and evaluate it. And this really gives a good, um, like for good practices in the community because uh, then your model is evaluated by a, a, an objective third party and then we can really compare, um, compare, uh, compare results. Okay, so one of the tricks of the trade, so I've mentioned uh, in, the, uh, in, in the presentation about the detectors, um, I've mentioned the, the hard negative mining which uh, is uh, an important trick that appears in many different places. Uh, another trick that I want to, to mention is transfer learning. So uh, transfer learning is defined in terms of a domain and a task. So and as a, a domain is a set of features that follow some probability distribution. And then a task uh, is a pair, uh, like this pair, so the task is the pair Y and a function approximator. So Y is a set of uh, ground truth labels. And then I have a function approximator that takes in uh, features, uh, data points from, my, uh, from my, the feature set in my domain and produces predictions. And then I train this uh, function approximator to, to give predictions that are as close as possible to, to the ground truth. Yeah. Now, um, when we train all these kind of tasks, visual tasks, like uh, uh, object detection or semantic segmentation, uh, like, uh, we, we can notice that the features must be shared because they are, so, uh, they, they are related. Like object detection, as I said, is a classification problem plus localization. So the intuition is that any features, every fe the features that were uh, learned in uh, classification, they should be used, like, useful for, uh, for object detection as well. So we should not start from scratch all the time when we, when we train uh, a new model. So we want to reuse the knowledge. And then 
we can reuse the knowledge either across domains or across tasks. And we will see uh, how, to, how to do that. So the simplest uh, transfer learning setting is to transfer across tasks. So let's say I have an image, uh, I have trained an image classifier, and now I want to train, I, I want to get an object detector. What I, what I can do is to start, uh, when I design my model for object detection, I just start from the image classifier. I might remove some of the blocks, which are not, um, like, because like in object detection, you have a different structure in the output. Uh, so what we need to do is to remove the, the last uh, layers, let's say in the object, uh, in the image classifier, and add new layers that would adapt to the new structure that I need in the output. And then we just initialize the weights of the layers that I've kept. I initialize them from the, from the image classifier. And then uh, the, the extra modules that I've added, those will be trained from scratch. Whereas the other ones that I've initialized from the, from the image classifier, they can be fine-tuned, so I continue training on them. Or they can, could even be frozen. But that, uh, yeah, it really depends on the problem when, uh, when it's best to do what. So this is a very, very useful trick to, to do that you don't, because training uh, like takes time and, and energy, right, to, to train a system. So we should not just throw away if we have an image classifier. Uh, like this is a very common thing in the, in the community. Almost every model that you see uh, in a paper, they do start from an image, pre-trained image classifier to like reuse the, the features that were learned in classification. And a paper that, uh, that really studies this problem of transfer learning between tasks uh, is this, the Tasconomy, Tasconomy paper. Uh, a, very nice, uh, like a very nice analysis. So they consider like 20, 26 tasks, visual tasks, like uh, I don't know, computing normals in the scene or two, key, two D key points. Um, let's see, what, uh, what do we have? Like semantic segmentation, what we've seen, object classification, um, 3D key points, colorization, yeah. So many different tasks, they, uh, they consider many different tasks. And the question that they ask is, okay, in which order should we learn these tasks? So uh, basically what they do, they consider a set of uh, source uh, tasks and then a set of target tasks. And they train models for the source tasks. And then they, um, they, uh, they check in which, uh, how should they combine those source uh, networks to transfer knowledge to, to the target networks. But yeah, uh, have a look at uh, this paper. It, yeah, it's a, it's a very nice, uh, nice analysis. Okay, and the second uh, case of uh, transfer learning that I want to mention is when we transfer, uh, transfer across domains. So this is a project that, uh, a very cool project that uh, you might have heard of, uh, uh, solving Rubik's Cube from, uh, from OpenAI. So basically here they use the robotic hand uh, to actually solve the, the Rubik's Cube. And uh, doing this like in real, real world, uh, using like a real robotic hand would be extremely difficult to train because it really requires a lot of data. And uh, to, to do, yeah, when you do this in, in, real, in real world, you can re easily break that robotic hand because at the beginning when it's not trained, it will do all kinds of weird, uh, weird, weird movements. Uh, so uh, then the, the important thing here is to actually train first in simulation. You train uh, your model in simulation, and then uh, you transfer this into the, real, uh, into the real world. So here the source domain is uh, like simulation, and then the, the target domain is the real world. And like the ingredient that makes this work, this transfer work, is this automatic domain randomization, how they call it. So basically this has two, like two, two, two parts. First is they do extensive data augmentation. So data augmentation was mentioned in the previous lecture is when let's say you have a training set, uh, but of course a training set very rarely will cover exhaustively all the possible transformations that you can have uh, in your inputs. So what you can do is you take your training set and then you apply randomly transformations like um, cropping or uh, rotation or jittering. Yeah, this kind of, uh, different kind of transformations 
so that you can uh, augment your training set, so that you cover better the, the space of transformation and you can make your, your model more robust to such uh, transformations. So yeah, in this paper, they use extensively the, this kind of data augmentation techniques, plus they use, again, the hard negative mining that I mentioned earlier, such that they can identify what are the most useful transformations to use uh, that would generate the best training signal. And yeah, after, after that, they were able to actually uh, run this then in real world and to actually solve the, the Rubik's Cube, which, yeah, I think is quite impressive. Okay. Okay, so we've covered the, the first part with the, with the classification. And we will go now to see how we can, uh, uh, what we can use uh, beyond, the, beyond just single, single image input. So I think for questions, we will take the questions at the end. Um, So, okay, let's see what other kinds of inputs we can use for, for our network, right? Like the first question is why do we want to use more, like we've seen we have very nice uh, models that can do object detection, semantic segmentation, only with images, why do we need to use more than, uh, more than just images? And I'm going to show here uh, an experiment, like a study that was done on patients recovering from, uh, from blindness. So. They have undergone uh, surgeries late in life uh, to, to recover sight. So, and they, they had these operations where, when they were already able to speak, so to communicate, so they could tell what they were seeing uh, during, the, during like, their recovery period. So, uh, <coughs> so during uh, like, uh, at, uh, one week, I think, or two weeks after, after the operation, uh, they, they were shown this kind, of, uh, uh, this kind of images and they were tested for, for their visual abilities. So, uh, yeah. I guess uh, these are pretty simple images, right? Uh, it's not, uh, there's no, no trick there, there's no... Uh, so they were just asked, okay, for, this, for the first image, okay, how many objects do you see? Yeah, simple, two objects, everybody agrees, two objects, yeah. And then the same for the second and the same for, for all the images, right? Um, and they were shown like multiple trials, different uh, instances of similar images to, to test for robustness. Uh, and then, yeah, like this one contains like a 3D object and they were asked the same question, how many objects they can see? And then this like to trace what is the, the longer curve in the, in the image. Uh, and they were also shown like natural images like, okay, uh, and they were asked how many objects are in the image or if they can recognize the images, the, the objects in the image. So important to, to, note, to, to note is that these were um, like children or adults who had already interacted with this kind of objects, but through other senses, not through, through sight. So they knew what a triangle is, they knew what a square is, they knew what a cow is. So, and the, the result, um, so for the first test, so in blue, uh, the light blue, we have the control group. So like people with normal sight. Yeah, so they did uh, very well on all the, on all the tasks. Um, and then the, these other three are three patients, like the results from three patients. And these are the, the results that they got. So in the first case, they were, all three were correct on the, um, and then, but they, they were wrong in both these cases. Uh, here, they were correct. Uh, here they were like correct, but uh, only like 50% of the time. Here they were so-so, mm -hmm. and here they, they were wrong all the time. Now the simple, uh, and then okay, for the real image, they did not recognize the object. They could not tell how many objects are in the image. Uh, and when they were asked like to draw where, the, where they think the objects are in the image, this is what they drew. Um, so now, when we look at the results, <laughs> what, uh, what do we observe? So here, they were correct uh, because the objects are completely separate, right? But as soon as the objects start having overlap, they don't know how to separate the, how to parse the image, right? Uh, here, they were correct because the two different objects, they overlap, but they have different colors. 
uh, here uh, for depth, yeah, they, they were not uh, very good. So like the conclusion is that at that point in their learning, uh, in their learning period after the, uh, the operation, they were using uh, contours and color as main cues to understand objects, to understand, to separate objects in a scene. So here, just, to, just following the contour gave them the correct uh, result. But here, if you just start following the contour, you will not get two objects there, right? You can say, I don't know what number, like maybe three, or I don't know what number you, you might say. So, very interestingly, after that, they were shown uh, the same images, but of moving objects, right? So, the same type of images with overlapping objects, but now they are moving. They are moving in different directions, which is uh, like relative, uh, relative motion. And actually now, they did much, much better, right? So, compared to before, on this uh, same, on these two types of images, like before, they were really no, no uh, correct answer. Now, they really started to, uh, to give correct answers for, for, that, uh, for those types of images. And another example where they showed like, this kind of uh, triangle uh, with some clutter in the scene, they were so-so at, at saying what is the object there. However, when that object started to move, then they could immediately tell what the correct object is. So all this is to say, that motion really helps um, when learning, uh, helps for object recognition when we learn to see. So it might not be as obvious that motion is important once you, once you know how to see, once you've learned that, but during the learning process, motion is very important and is as important as contours and as important as colors in distinguishing uh, objects. And another, uh, another experiment that was carried out was on, on uh, chicks and they were shown uh, videos of uh, smoothly moving, uh, smoothly moving objects, or uh, or frames from video, but taken not in order. So uh, here you have temporally smooth object, moving object, whereas here you have uh, you have frames from the same uh, sequence, but they are not in order. So you don't have a temporal smoothness in uh, in your input. Uh, and what they've observed is that the the chicks that were raised uh, using this kind of input, they've learned uh, robust representations for the objects, like uh, representations that were robust to, to transformations that they hadn't seen during training. Whereas the, the chicks that were raised with this kind of inputs, they really overfit to the transformation that they've seen and they were not able to recognize the same object under different, uh, different viewpoints. So again, this uh, is to, to confirm that motion is really important when we learn to see. So, the, like the conclusion is that using videos should be like the, 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 the main direction in, uh, in training also the video, the, the, like the vision models that, uh, that we want to design. Because as I said, motion provides important cues for object recognition and uh, we have like a natural data augmentation. Uh, we have all these kind of uh, transformations that, uh, that uh, occur in the real world. So translation scale, 3D rotation, camera motion, light changes and everything. So you get this in the video and then you can train your model to, um, to, to learn representations that are robust to this kind of uh, changes. Okay, so uh, let's see what, uh, this is what we will cover in this, uh, in this part. So we will see what we can do when we have pairs of uh, images as input and when we have videos as input. And then uh, we'll see what kind of tasks become available when we have more than, a, more than a single image as input. And we will look at optical flow estimation and uh, action recognition. And then we will see different types of models for, for these tasks. And we will discuss a bit like the challenges that we have, that we encounter when we use more than single images. Okay, so let's start with pairs of images. And we will look at optical flow estimation. So optical flow estimation um, is looking at motion, like uh, tracking changes from uh, between, between images. So let's, in this cartoonish uh, uh, picture, let's say we have two images, and I don't know, maybe there's a wind, there's wind blowing there or something. Uh, and in optical flow, 
uh, we are given in optical for estimation, we are given a pair of images, and then we want to say for each pixel uh, in uh, image one, where did that pixel end up in image two, right? Uh, so the output of uh, such a model would be again a dense, a dense output like in semantic segmentation, and each, um, uh, so, and we have real, uh, these are real values like for each position. And then at each uh, location we encode the 2D, 2D translation that, um, that affected that, uh, that pixel. So we have the displacement in X and Y. Uh, yeah, so maybe for this kind of, uh, for this uh, pair of images, maybe it would look something like this. So these are the pixels that moved in the X direction and these are the ones that moved in the Y direction. And we can see that like the overlapping ones, they moved in both, uh, both directions. And let's see uh, a model that can, uh, can do this very simply. Uh, so FlowNet. Uh, this again is an encoder-decoder architecture. So it's very similar to what we've seen already, like for semantic segmentation and object detection. Um, I think the exception here is that we have this encoder-decoder, but we don't have the long skip connections. It, could, it would have helped, but probably they just didn't think back then to, to use those uh, long skip connections. Uh, so yeah, we have, so we take a pair of images as input, we pass uh, through this uh, encoder and decoder, and then, so we have the decoder to upsample because the output, as I said, we want it to be as the same, uh, the same resolution as, uh, as the input. And then we, we can train this in a fully supervised regime. And uh, we can use, uh, they, they use the SLOS, the Euclidean distance between the predictions of the network and the ground truth. Uh, and to train this, uh, they use the flying chairs data set, the data set that they've invented. Um, so uh, you might imagine that uh, generating ground truth for such a task could be very difficult. Like if uh, you just show to a person two images and you ask the person, okay, now tell me where did each pixel from one image went to, to the other image? This is like, yeah, it's impossible to, to, to get this kind of labels from, uh, from humans. So what they did is they generated automatically these uh, this labels. So basically they just took, um, they just took real images and then they took uh, 3D models of objects, like of uh, familiar objects like chairs, yeah? And then they generated views from those, uh, those chairs. Like the, these are 3D, 3D models like meshes and then they just rendered views from those, uh, from those models and then they overlaid them over the, over the real images, yeah? And what I'm showing here, like you have, this is a pair of images that, and we want to estimate the optical flow between, uh, between those two images. And here I'm showing like the ground truth. So as I said, optical flow is generally uh, two, uh, like we have two layers in the feature map for displacement in X and Y. Here we are just using like a mapping in three, uh, in three channels so that we can display them uh, as an RGB image. But yeah, this is like the, the ground truth optical flow that, um, that we want the, the system to learn to, to generate. And again, this is, uh, this is an example of transfer uh, from sim to real, because we use this simulated environments yeah, to, to learn about motion, and then we test this in real world. And this actually works because, so these are completely non-realistic images, right? You don't see flying chairs anywhere <laughs> normally. <laughs> but um, what is real, realistic is the motion. Like, because what we actually want to capture is that pixels that move together, they belong to the same object. That's, a, that's a, the underlying uh, assumption. And this, the, the system can learn this from this kind of uh, toyish data. Yeah, and this actually, yeah, this uh, works well. Okay, now let's see what uh, we, we can do when we have like a, a full video as input before we've seen like pairs of, uh, pairs of images. Um, so uh, what kind of models uh, can we use when we have, uh, when we have videos as, as input? So the first, uh, like the, the obvious answer is to say, okay, I will take my image model, uh, like a segmentation, semantic segmentation model, and I can just apply that on the, on the consecutive frames of a video. And that's it, that's my, uh, that's my video model. And we can do that and we can get decent, uh, decent results. 
So yeah, here is just a segmentation model that is run over the consecutive frames in a, in a video. And then we have like a segmented video. However, uh, the problem in doing this is that we cannot take advantage of, uh, of the properties that we know about, about videos. We know that, the, for example, that the videos are smooth. That, so you don't have uh, objects flying around uh, in any location. So uh, like, let's see. Uh, so normally, let's see, a flickering somewhere, like here, oh, if, you, if you've seen it. So there are many kinds, many parts in the segmentation map that flicker from one frame to the other. So that actually occurs because uh, the frames are treated independently. Whereas ideally you would want, when you make a prediction for a new frame, you would want to take into account the prediction from the previous frame because things move smoothly you know, in, in the real world, right? So this is the, like the, the disadvantage of, of using this type of models, like image-based uh, image model. So another, let's say, more adapted um, model for videos is to use 3D convolutions. So you've seen 2D convolutions uh, in, the, in the previous lectures for, for images. Now we can consider videos as a volume and we just stack, uh, we just stack frames. So then we obtain volumes like this. So I, normally I would have images that have height and width in three channels. Now we stack them along the time dimension and we obtain this, uh, this volume, yeah, this video volume. And then we can apply 3D convolution. So uh, before, like the kernel that we use for 2D convolutions so had a 2D shape, and now we have uh, the kernels are also 3D, 3D kernels. And in, a, in 2D, you would have to, you would slide the you'd slide the kernel over the the image over the spatial dimensions in the image to obtain uh, the feature the the output the feature maps. Now for for videos with three D convolutions, we just need to slide uh, in all the in uh, both in space and in time to obtain the full uh, to obtain uh, uh, as output this uh, volume of uh, spatial temporal uh, spatial temporal features. Now, some uh, to, important to note, all the properties uh, from 2D convolutions, they apply to 3D convolutions as well. So all the notions about strided and dilation and padding, they apply in 3D as well. Uh, something that it's maybe worth, uh, worth noting um, is that 3D convolutions are, are non-causal. And what this means is that um, when I compute the, the activation for this unit here, T, uh, for this unit uh, at time T, I need the frame from time T plus one. Let's, assuming that I'm using a three cross three, three cross three um, um, convolutional filter. Um, so I need, to, I need to have access to, to the future because the receptive field in the, uh, the, for, for 3D convolutions is uh, symmetric. Uh, right, you you look uh, you look in the past and you look in the future to uh, to compute your activations, um, and that's why because you need to look into the future. That's why these are non-causal operations, and this is fine for uh, for offline processing of videos. Right, if I just want, let's say, I just have a a number of videos and I just want to classify uh, them into actions, different types of actions. Uh, and this is an offline processing, so I can, at any point in time, I, I have access to future frames. So that is fine, we can, we can use that. However, um, in other applications, like real-time applications in robotics or any, or any um, like uh, uh, self-driving self, uh, self -driving cars or other uh, applications that run in real-time, you don't have access to, uh, to the future frames. You just receive a frame at a time and then you have to make computation to process that frame and then you can move, uh, move on. So uh, in that case, to still uh, use 3D convolution, you would have to use uh, like a masked 3D convolution where we, we literally put, like, put a mask on the, on the weights of the filter that actually need to look into the future. And then in that, uh, doing that, we can use uh, 3D convolutions also for, uh, for, for causal, for setting that require causal processing. Okay, so now that we have this uh, powerful 3D convolution models, let's see what we can do. 
For example, we can do action recognition. Uh, so in action, um, in action recognition, uh, you receive <coughs> uh, you receive a, a video as as input. So again, we have the volume. Uh, uh, T is the number of frames, uh, and then the dimension, the spatial dimension of the frames, and then three channels. Optionally, you could have a flow map that was uh, computed um, externally by, uh, like for example, uh, uh, the flow net that I've shown. Yeah. You can, uh, so you can use um, this, this as inputs to your network, and then the output uh, that we want is uh, like a label for the type of action that we see in the in the video, and then yeah, in this case we would have like a cricket shot. And a very popular data set used uh, for this task was uh, was collected uh, uh, by colleagues in, uh, in DeepMind uh, is Kinetics Kinetics data set, uh, which is a very large scale data set. So it tries to get to the same scale as ImageNet. So currently it is at 600,000 uh, training. Uh, uh, training videos, but like the aim is to have one million, uh, and we have 600 classes, and all the videos uh, come from curated YouTube uh, YouTube videos, and yeah, each uh, each video in the data set has 250 frames, so uh, it's about these are clips of uh, around 10 10 seconds, so uh, 25 frames per second, like the current accuracy on this data set, it's around 82 uh, percent. So yeah, there's still room for, for improvement. Um, okay, so now just to, as a case study to see a model that uh, can actually do uh, action recognition. This is a very, a very accurate model uh, and efficient. So actually it uses like a, a two branch model. Um, so the first branch processes a processes the video at a lower frame rate, and then the second uh, branch looks at, uh, at the video, processes the video at a higher, uh, higher frame rate. And uh, this uh, kind of two branch model, uh, the, the inspiration is from the human, uh, human visual system. Like in the, we, know, like we know that the human, uh, humans process, have a, a two stream uh, visual system, so they kind of borrow the same intuition. And what they, what they aim to do is, so for the lower frame rate uh, stream, they have um, heavier uh, feature maps. So they extract more features from the lower, uh, lower frame rate. Uh, and then for the higher frame rate here, they extract only very few features. Um, so their, their intuition here is to say that this part is responsible with extracting um, abstract uh, abstract features about the scene. For example, uh, object category. Right. So, if I have a chair in uh, in the scene, or if I have a person in the scene, uh, I will still have that chair in the scene, even if I look only every tenth frame. Right. That the chair will not evaporate, will not, or the person will not disappear all of a sudden. Um, and so this branch is responsible with extracting this kind of abstract information, like the class, uh, class category. Whereas this branch here, that looks at, uh, at frames at a higher uh, frame rate, uh, is responsible with uh, tracking changes, like things that can move very fast, like anything that is related to motion and changes. This is what, but, and they um, hypothesize that this, uh, that you need less features to, to do this, uh, to, to extract this kind of information. And then they merge the two streams, like uh, uh, different, uh, different points in the, uh, in the branches, and then they make the final prediction uh, by, by concatenating the two, the two streams. And this is actually a very, a very, good, uh, very good model. So uh, like, just to, to, um, to make a comparison, uh, we've seen like, the models that we, we saw for semantic segmentation and object detection for images they also used like a hierarchy, hierarchy of features, like where they looked at different resolution, uh, resolutions in space, and that worked really well. Now this here, this model looks at different resolutions in time. Yeah, so they're kind of the same, the same principles of uh, of having this hierarchy of uh, of features at different uh, resolutions. 
Okay, so one more thing to note. Uh, again, transfer learning, uh, the, the trick of the trade that I mentioned in the first part for the object detectors. Uh, this applies here as well. So if we have an image, uh, an image classifier already trained, we can use that to initialize uh, our weights for the, for the 3D uh, convolutional model as well. Uh, however, as I, as I said, in 2D convolutions, your filters are 2D. In 3D, uh, for, uh, for 3D convolutions, your filters are now 3D. Uh, so the, the shapes don't, uh, don't match. But to, to deal with this, uh, we, we only need to tile along the, the time dimension so that we can get, uh, like, we just replicate, we just replicate the ways that we have here, we replicate along the time, and then we can initialize this. And this makes sense because, like, if you just tile an image, uh, you, will, uh, you will obtain something that is a valid video. Uh, it's a video of a static scene that was filmed with a, with a fixed camera, right? So. Uh, that's why it really it makes sense to do this kind of uh, operation. And then, of course, this is just to initialize your system. Then you train the system to actually learn about the motion and all the changes in the in the videos. Okay. So, working with videos is great, and I hope I convinced you that motion is very important to to learn about objects. Why don't why don't we all use uh, use videos? Well, the the reason is that there are several challenges uh, in doing this. Uh, first of all, it's very difficult to obtain labels. So in, it's difficult in general to obtain labels, even for images. And I will address this, uh, this point uh, in the third part. Um, however, uh, the other challenges that I, I won't uh, cover in detail are the fact that now we, have, we need uh, a much larger memory actually to do the processing. So imagine, as I said, like in kinetics data set, one, one training sample has 250 frames. That is equivalent to training like an image classifier with a mini batch of 250. That's quite a lot. Like we can't really fit that easily on a, on a GPU. Um, another problem is that these uh, models can be quite, uh, quite slow uh, because these 3D convolutions uh, require a lot of computation. And then, of course, uh, all this computation comes with a high energy, high energy consumption. So, like, just to, to give a, a, an idea, like a current GPU that we would use to, to run an object detector or an action recognition model uh, consumes around 100 watts, which is kind of 10 times more than the human brain. Uh, and the human brain really <laughs> performs so many tasks in parallel. Uh, so. Yeah, these models are really uh, energy hungry. Um, at least at this point, this, uh, this is how they are. Uh, and yeah, but I think there, there is hope uh, to improve on these models. And actually this is my main, uh, my main area of research at this moment, like improving the efficiency of, uh, of video models. And we use a lot of inspiration from, uh, from biological systems and uh, from biological systems, but also like from general computers. Um, and like the first thing that we are looking at is how to maximize parallelism uh, to, to increase throughput and, uh, and reduce uh, latency. Uh, and we, we do this because like there is strong evidence from the neuroscience community that like the, the performance of the human brain is explained by the parallel computation that it, uh, that it does. So, uh, and we have the same thing like in, uh, in general computer processors. So uh, all the pipelining operations that you might be familiar from computer, computer architectures. So you have, let's say, a larger, uh, larger instruction. Uh, you break down into smaller, uh, smaller instructions that can be executed by different units in, uh, in, the, in your processor. So then you can actually uh, pipeline the operation so that all the units can work in parallel. So you don't need to do operations in, uh, in sequence. And this is exactly the, the same principle that we try to, uh, to bring for, for neural networks so that, so that we can maximize parallelism across the depth of the, of the network. And another thing that uh, I'm, uh, I'm looking at is how to exploit the redundancies in the visual data. So uh, when we have a high frame rate uh, video, like all the, like the, in, in local neighborhoods, the frames will be very, very similar. 
So we don't need to process all the, <clears throat> all the frames at the same resolution all the time. So basically here, uh, we are training a, a model to, to blink. <laughs> so humans blink a lot. Uh, so it, it's, um, uh, it, it's thought, it was thought that uh, we blink only to clean the eye, uh, and that is true. However, uh, studies have shown that actually we blink more, uh, more often than needed to clean the eye. So then the explanation is that probably we blink so that we can reduce the activity in the brain. Because like the visual system really is the part uh, that consumes most of the energy in the brain. So if you can turn that down <laughs> like for now and then, it's really very useful. So this is what uh, I'm working uh, on at the moment, like how to make this model to learn to exploit the redundancies in the, in the data. Okay, so, okay, I'll just briefly go through the third, uh, third part where we want to see what we can do uh, beyond strong supervision. Okay, so we want to go beyond uh, strong supervision because as I said, labeling is very tedious. And it's tedious for images, and it's even more tedious for uh, for videos. Like imagine, it's hard. In, like if you want to, if you want to, uh, uh, if you ask a person to um, to to create ground truth for a segmentation task, you would have to take an image, and then you have to draw contours, uh, uh, yeah, around the the objects, and to say, okay, this is a car, this is the road, and so on. Now imagine doing this on a video, so you have to multiply that same task like 250 times. So this is, uh, yeah. Uh, you can't really do that. Um, so like, labeling has become a research topic in itself uh, and how to make it easier. So one, uh, one direction, for example, is that you ask humans to, a human expert to only label some frames, some key frames, and then you can have models, uh, methods that can propagate those, uh, those labels across time, exploiting the properties of videos, like the smoothness that, uh, that I mentioned. However, um, when we don't have uh, labels, what, what can we do? So uh, we might have uh, different information about the data and not the strong labels uh, that, that we know. So in, in the general setting, when we, we use the standard losses like cross entropy and mean, mean squared error, uh, the goal there is to learn a mapping between some inputs and some output distribution or values like we've seen for detection or, uh, or segmentation. <coughs> but now, uh, if we have a weaker, some, some weaker labels or some weaker form of similarity in the data, we can actually use metric learning. And now we can learn about uh, distances between the inputs. So for a very uh, um, uh, a classic example of this case is that we might have a data set of images and we know which images belong to the same person, right? And now what we can do is to learn an embedding where the images, so you, as you can see, the images belong to the same person, but they're really very different, uh, like when we look in the pixel space, right? Uh, and this, again, they're all very different. But we know, okay, that this picture, they all come from the same person, and then this come from another person. And what we might want to do is to train, uh, to learn an embedding where the pictures that belong to the same person, so we just, this is our label, same person or not, or different person. And we just want to train a system that uh, clusters together in this embedding, uh, clusters together the pictures from the same person, and then uh, puts far apart images that uh, come from, uh, from different person. And another, so, and then this can be used like for, uh, for image retrieval. Like I'm given a new, a new uh, image, and then I want to know to which person does this belong? And then I can this, just project this into my embedding space and I can get the nearest neighbor there and then I know to which person this uh, picture belongs to. Um, another <clears throat> possible application for this is for example when uh, you have medical data uh, and maybe it's a high dimensional data that you don't know how to interpret uh, but what you can do is to train a model that learns this kind of Im embedding and then you can learn, okay, what makes two people different? And if you know that, okay, maybe one person has a disease, then you can, uh, you can try to trace where, where are the differences, why, what causes that, uh, that disease. So the things that uh, you can uh, use in this kind of space for, for metric learning, so there are different losses that we can use so to replace like the cross entropy and uh, 
the mu squared error that we've seen. So we can use contrastive loss or triplet loss. Um, and I will uh, just mention briefly like a paper that was published like a week ago uh, on that is now the state of the art in, uh, in this field. Uh, so yeah, as I said, there are different applications that become available when we do this kind of, uh, this kind of uh, when we train this type of types of uh, model. And yeah, we don't have time to go in detail, but you can, uh, you can check these references <coughs> to get an idea. So for contrastive loss, um, as, as I said, we have pairs. We just have, uh, let's say we have a data set where we have pairs of, uh, of data points and we just know if those points belong to the same, uh, same person or not same person. And then what we want to do, like the label will be one if it's same person or zero otherwise. And then we want to, to train an embed, to, to train a network that projects my data points into an embedding where points from that are same, they attract each other and then they're, they're different, they reject each other. So, uh, and then we can use this contrastive loss to train such a, such a system. So you can easily observe that when, um, when, when I have uh, y equal to one, so it's the same person, I want to minimize the distance between the two points. Whereas when I have y equal to zero, so these are different people, uh, I want to maximize the difference, the distance between the two. However, we don't want to maximize like uh, infinitely the distance. We don't want to send them too far apart. Uh, because that would be like uh, yeah, consuming energy for, for no good reason. So that's why we put a margin and we say, okay, as soon as the, those points are further than a margin, I'm happy enough, all right? So this is exactly what we're plotting here. So this, the blue curve corresponds to, to pairs that belong to the same person. So as the distance increases, the loss will increase as well. Whereas the red curve corresponds to different uh, points that uh, come from different people and then this loss uh, for a margin of, let's say this value, uh, <clears throat> beyond this value, this loss is zero. So I don't care anymore to, to push those points apart as, uh, as soon as they, uh, they are <clears throat> further than this uh, margin M. Now, the problem with this uh, is that how, how do we choose this margin? Because uh, this would be like a fixed margin for all the classes. And then some classes might be more uh, more distinct, more varied, like in, in the case of the uh, pictures that I've shown with the faces. Uh, in, <clears throat> for some persons, the pictures might be more, more similar. For some, they might be very, very different. Uh, and then if we impose a margin M like this for all the people, then I would force all the, all the classes to be clustered in a, in a ball with the same radius M. And this is not, uh, like this can, can lead to in, in unstable training what is uh, more robust to do and, and better to do is to use a triplet loss, for example, where we can actually use like relative distances. So in the triplet loss, I'm looking, I'm using like triplets with one anchor point, and then I have a positive point and a negative point. And then I want the positive pair to attract and then the negative pair to reject. But I want to reject this only such that is further away than my, uh, than my positive, right? And now I also have a margin, but now this really allows to have classes that are embedded in different, uh, in, different in, in balls with different ranges. So then we can uh, really uh, allow for, for some distortions in the, in the embedding space. So uh, again, hard negative mining returns, that uh, what I mentioned earlier. Uh, it's really important how, how we select the triplets so that we train uh, the systems. And yeah, I encourage you to, uh, to have a look at this paper, Sampling Matters in, uh, in Deep Embedding Learning to, to see in detail how they uh, do that. And very quickly, like state of the art in uh, representation learning. Uh, here, <clears throat> so is the, probably the simplest uh, uh, type of, uh, of metric learning that we can have. So before I showed the uh, examples where we have same person, so that's your label, is the same person. Here we have the label is same image, right? So I just have an image and I apply different data augmentations to the image. And then I just train a system to say, okay, all these different data augmentations, they actually belong to this image. And then when I show another image of another dog and I apply different data augmentations to that other dog, the system needs to learn 
Okay, this actually comes from a different image, right? So now, like the label now is this same, same image. And this is like really easy to obtain because, yeah, you just generate uh, automatically all this data, all the data augmentations, and you can train the, the system. And actually, this uh, now achieves a really, really good accuracy, which is comparable. So this is uh, the, this new data point, and it's comparable with the supervised regime. So the representations that you get using this kind of metric learning, where you generate automatically the labels, these representations are now as good as the representations <clears throat> that you learn using the full labels from, from ImageNet. And this is like really, really important for, it's a really important result for the, for the community. Okay, and yeah, I will just end with just few words because I think we're all kind of out of time. Um, Fjords on the open questions uh, in, the, in the field. So first question. So we've seen so many, so many cool applications. We can do object detection, semantic segmentation, optical flow estimation, and action recognition, and more. Is vision solved, right? right? Um, however, I think a better, maybe another question to ask is what does it really mean to solve vision? And I've said at the beginning that we really, we want human levels in understanding, that that's like the, the holy grail. However, how do we benchmark that? What is the right task? Like, okay, we can have a data set for, uh, I don't know, for object detection. But data sets can overfit, like models can overfit, or um, it can work well on a data set, but then when you train it on another data set, it doesn't work as well. So it's really hard for at least at this moment, it's hard to say what do we need to achieve to, to say that, okay, we've solved, uh, we've solved vision. And then another very important problem is how to scale systems up. So I've shown models that do, uh, most of the models that I've shown do one task, like they do object detection or they do optical flow estimation and so on. But we really need a system that can do all of them. Like in the same way that we as humans can, can do all, that's what we, we, we aim for. So I really believe that to scale system up, systems up, we really need to look at model parallels, and maybe we need a different kind of hardware, uh, yeah, a better hardware, and for sure we need to look at, at methods that require less supervision. And like a question is, okay, what are good visual representations for action? Because in the end, we want to have this, uh, this powerful visual uh, models and to put them into an agent that can then act in the world. Like what are the good representations that, uh, is, is semantic segmentation a good enough representation? I think not, but uh, yeah, this is still really uh, open for, for discussion. And I just put here like <clears throat> a nice paper that uh, for example uses uh, key points to represent objects and they test this in, um, like in a control task. So I guess uh, the takeaway message, uh, for, for, this, uh, for this lecture would be that I really believe that learning to see from static images uh, makes thing, things harder than they should be. And kind of unfortunately, because of different challenges, this is the main, uh, the main uh, area of research at the moment, but I really hope that uh, things will change and we will start be using more and more videos. And I think we really need to rethink vision models, the way we design them and how we train them from the perspective of moving pictures and really having the, the end goal in, in mind, like to think about the intelligent agents that would interact with the real world and uh, interact in real time. Yeah, so thank you. Thank you.